International Pragmatics Association is trying to set up this repository of voices in pragmatics. And of course, you're one of the main people that we want to have. And this is for younger generations who haven't had direct access to you or in the next 20 years will may not have access to you, but they'll have a chance of hearing you and being inspired by your trajectory. Thank you. It's, it's, cool. it's an enormous honor to be able to talk for you. Well, it's, it's an honor that you've accepted. So I was thinking that perhaps we could um, like divide the interview into sort of different sections, but we can have it as a conversation. Okay. Um, so if we could start off a bit, I was thinking a bit with your per personal trajectory and what led you into the field of what you're doing. Um, perhaps more on, on what inspired you, who inspired you, how you started out, what your childhood started out and how it led you to where you are today. Um, and then a, perhaps we could talk a bit about the founding of the field because uh, the founding of critical discourse analysis has always been like an enterprise that has been important to you. Um, whereas it's, it's interesting why this, this, this foundational impulse, um, why you consider it important and, and, and what legacy okay. you have there. And, um, and then perhaps if we have time to talk a bit about your particular approach, if you consider it a particular approach to uh -huh. critical discourse studies as opposed to critical discourse analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as much as time will give us, because it's, uh, it's a privilege. So, so to, let's start off with your, with your trajectory. Where were you born? How was living in post-World War II Netherlands? Um, and how did you get to where you are? Thank you. Let's, okay, let's begin at the beginning. Um, yes. I was born in a village in Holland between Rotterdam and The Hague called Nautwijk uh -huh. uh, in 43, in the middle of the war. In the middle? When my father was transported as a, you know, a laborer in uh, Nazi Germany. So he wasn't there when I was born. And much of that uh, history, of course, continues also in my mind until, until today. Um, my, I guess as a child in a, in a rather poor family, uh, we didn't have any books at home except from the Bible uh, of a Protestant, uh, Calvinistic Protestant uh, uh -huh. family. So the only uh, readings I had in the beginning was reading the Bible for the family because I was the eldest of five. Uh -huh. uh, so I know the Bible quite well because I always had to read parts of the Bible before dinner. Uh -huh. So that's one, that's let's say the first reading experience. And in this village where I grew up uh, between the Hague and Leiden, which is called Bassen, a beautiful village uh, at the sea with beautiful dunes and huge beach and so on. Uh, I, they had a small library and since we didn't have book at home, I just went there each Wednesday afternoon when we were free, free from school, I went there to get books and I read a lot of books, children books in the beginning of course and then soon also uh, books for uh, <clears throat> grown-ups, adults, uh, with 15, 16 also books in English. So I began to really read literature when I was about 15 or 16, Dutch <laughs> literature and then also things in English like Agatha Christie, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. uh, so that was my first reading, so I very soon was hooked in literature and also as a, as a young boy, 16, 17, uh, falling in love with a girl in dance class, uh, reading and writing poetry and so on. So my first writings were actually were in poetry and I still have them, a, a little, of course never published. Uh -huh. And it was modern poetry inspired by uh, Dutch modern poetry after the war. That's basically my first experience with reading and writing before I went to university. Uh -huh. uh, and then I went to Amsterdam uh, to study French language and literature, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> reading more literature, reading more poetry than I had to do it to get a grade in, 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 in French. Uh -huh. um, and 
Why, why did you decide on French as opposed that's a good to question. English? Or? It's, no, it's typical of many of my decisions because the French teachers at school was terrible. I said, I can do that better. Uh -huh. So I studied the French. I never wanted, to, afterwards, I never wanted to be a professor of, 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 of French, but it was terrible. And I had been uh, hitchhiking to France uh, also as, an, as, a, as a teenager and hitchhiking all the time to Spain, to Morocco, all over Europe, uh, before I went to the university. So I, I although we didn't have any money, uh -huh. I went to work in Germany, you know, in a construction firm and in Southern, in Munich as well, in a Kabelgraben, you know, you know like uh, digging, you know, these kinds of things, exactly, you know, <coughs> this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I had the jobs all over Europe and also work all over Europe. So there's also good to learn languages, of course. Uh -huh. So I, I, oh, we already had six languages at school, obligatory. Which yeah. languages were there? And so Latin, Greek, of course, because okay. it was grammar school, gymnasium, gymnasium. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, French, English, German, and Dutch, you know, so. So six languages, we had to do all of them. My granddaughters in Amsterdam, they still have to do that. They already finished school, they go to university already. So uh -huh. Anyway, so all over Europe. And then when I was a student of French, I also went to a study for a year in Strasbourg mm -hmm. in, in France. And after uh, completing my study and before my PhD, I went to study in Paris uh, with all these famous people. So I was in the classes of uh, Roland Barthes, okay. uh -huh. uh, Grémas in the laboratoire of uh, Lili Strauss. Uh -huh. uh, so that is where I got my education in French studies and then general literary studies and beginning of linguistics. So I still remember uh, presenting a paper in, in the seminar of Grémas on semantics, but I just discovered the semantics in the United States. And that, was, and that was Lakov, Macaulay, and these people uh -huh. of the who you know began to do semantics, criticizing Chomsky, uh -huh. and I had discovered that kind of semantics, and I presented that in the class in the seminar of Gremas, which he didn't like at all, because Gremas had published a book uh, on uh, semantique structurale, uh -huh. uh, and that was totally different from the kind of semantics they did in the United States. So he didn't like it at all. Uh -huh. And he later published a paper of mine uh, criticizing me uh -huh. in the preface of his book. Uh -huh. So that was very interesting. Well, that, <coughs> that's an honor for them too. So I, I had this background in French language and literature, which later always was always very useful. Uh -huh. uh, although then, when I started to really to write academic papers, I did it only in English. And so I did not, I did actually first, a first version of my PhD on text grammar I did in French. Mm -hmm. But a professor in Amsterdam, uh, Paul Zumthor, uh -huh. uh, went to Paris as far as I remember. So I had now a, a PhD supervisor. Uh, so the next uh, version I did in English with Simon Dick, who was a professor of linguistics in, in Amsterdam, in the same building where I was. Uh -huh. Uh, and that was already the time I already had my first job in the university as a teacher in a new department of what was called in Dutch Algemene Literatuurwetenschap, so mm -hmm. general literary studies. Uh, so after several years of being a young teacher without a PhD still uh -huh. in the university, I got a PhD in, ling in linguistics and from that moment on I left also literary studies behind and only published in, in uh, well, linguistics, discourse studies, text grammar, actually. So that is how it all began. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, that's, uh, that's an interesting background. So, so what would you say are the connections from literature to start doing discourse analysis well, and, and the critical approach that you take? Well, that is much later. Okay. So, we, so we go by stages. Let's go by stages, yeah. So I was, of course, interested in doing literature, and my first book in Dutch was about literary theory. Mm -hmm. Actually, I still remember writing that book uh, because I was, again, a motivation. 
the people in Holland teaching literature and literary studies, literary theory, yes. uh, in my view, had no idea about literary theory. It was more criticism, literary criticism, you uh -huh. know, inspired by the new criticism in, in the United States and so on, but not, I had, of course, a little bit of education in structural analysis uh, and in semantics, all these kind of things. So I thought you could do that much better. Mm -hmm. So my inspiration was actually to do a systematic, more linguistic approach to literature. So that's how I entered linguistics. Okay. I wanted to do more explicit, systematic literary theory. So I'm already in my dissertation on text grammar, there is chapters on metaphor and, and poetic language. So my, my, I made my thesis and this kind of thing were more about poetic language. That's how I came to linguistics. But then it came to linguistics and there was nothing about discourse. We only had, of course, you had, some, you had genitive linguistics, you had structural linguistics uh, in France and so on. So you had functional linguistics of the Prague school and so on and so on. So you had many approaches, but they all were working on sentences and not discourse. Right. So more and more <coughs> reading, beginning to read people in Germany Mm -hmm. who had been working or began to work also like me on discourse, the idea was, okay, to do a good application of linguistics to literature, you first have to develop a linguistics of discourse, at that time called text grammar. And there were people in Germany who were interested in text grammar. And thus there was a guy in, I think, Münster in Germany called Peter Hartmann. Uh -huh. And Peter Hartmann was someone who already in the 60s said we need something like a text grammar. He didn't develop it, but he did so. Mm -hmm. And he had students in Germany uh, like Siegfried Schmidt. Mm -hmm. And Siegfried Schmidt was a guy who uh, I think in the University of Mannheim, but I'm not sure anymore. I think he also came from Münster or something like that. And he, in I think 73, wrote a book called, in Germany, Text Theory, and so theory is text. Mm -hmm. When I was reading and writing about this kind of thing, and my dissertation, depends on text, I was in 72. So mm -hmm. all things for me began in 72. And the interesting thing is, many things in linguistics, in sociolinguistics, and so also began right then. Because mm -hmm. all book, first books of Bill Boff were all of 72. Yes. Uh, and, um, at the same time, just a little bit later, we had, of course, conversation analysis uh, when, uh, when yeah, they sure began in 74, yeah. you know, the, the famous paper on, on, uh, on turn taking. Yes. Um, and so on. So, all these things began at the same time. So, my motivation to study linguistics and to develop a linguistics of text and talk, and, uh, or discourse linguistics, and that time still text grammar. So, my dissertation was on text grammar. And when I was writing the dissertation, at the same time, I had all these inspirations, first from France, but also already reading much more things going on in, in the United States and in England with Halliday and all kinds of other people. So there was a multiple inspiration to do that kind of thing. Still very far from critical discourse studies, it was to do a linguistics of discourse, basically. It's like on methodology, develop a, a, a way of analyzing text. Well, simply right? ready the object in linguistic culture, same words and sentences, you know, right, grammar. Right, right. And grammar was never, you know. So when they began to think mm -hmm. of grammar of this, or linguistics of discourse, of like Michael Halliday in England and other people in the United States, also people, of course, in the Summer uh, Institute of Linguistics, people, yes. because that's cool. I knew all these things going on in many countries, and it inspired me to do, a, a, for the first time, a grammar of text, a text grammar. Mm -hmm. So that's how I began, actually, to do an application to literature. I never did literature anymore, so I found that so fascinating. So that's how I entered uh, into linguistics, first working together in, with people in, Ger in Germany, uh -huh. uh, in, in uh, Konstanz, so Peter Hartmann, who was, I think, in Münster, uh -huh. uh, he went to a new development and a new, uh, new department of linguistics in Konstanz. Yes. And other people were, were, were going there too. So there was Hans Riesa, 
yeah. uh, who did also lots of more formal work in, and also uh, Janusz Pietrowski from Hungary. Yes. So all these people were in Konstanz and I visited them uh, and uh, I also fell in love with the German woman and, uh -huh. and so on. So, so that is how, it, so for this, for this time and also with my uh, ex uh, German woman went to Amsterdam and so on and so on. So the first years of my academic work was actually in, in Germany. She got a job in Dusseldorf where, uh, um, um, where there was a new department of linguistics mm -hmm. uh, of Dieter Wunderlich. And Dieter Wunderlich is also one of the linguists who the first time did work on discourse and so on. So we commuted between Amsterdam and, and, and Dusseldorf Mm -hmm. And that is how my first academic work was actually very much related to developments in Germany. Mm -hmm. In Konstanz, there was a new, fa new faculty in, in Bielefeld. Uh -huh. um, and in Bielefeld, it was, it was all new. It was a new department of linguistics. Bielefeld was a new university, and Konstanz as well. And there were new departments, and the people who began to work there were also interested in discourse analysis. Mm -hmm. So. My first steps in discourse grammar and so on, so with Beckman in France, mm -hmm. uh, was basically reading much work from the United States, of course, and, and England and, and other countries. But the first context of actually working was in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And so you moved from Germany to to other topics that are more critical. Uh, how how did you? How did you have this, how did you, how did your trajectory move towards a more critical? That, again, we are not to, there. Um, we're not there yet, okay. <laughs> no, not it goes, you know, with many steps. Because one, one of the things was, I was at the same time, after my dissertation of 72, yes. uh, I also was more interested in logical, formal kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So I, I began to work on a book called Text and Context, Yes. which was finally published in 77 or something like that, mm -hmm. no, seven, 77. But I was reading many things in philosophy and logic because there were people in Amsterdam interested in the department of philosophy who were young logicians who later became very, very famous people uh, in, in Montague grammar and this kind okay. of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so these colleagues of mine actually were students uh, with them, uh, uh, I was learning about formal linguistics and formal grammar and, and logic, and I was reading many formal stuff. Mm -hmm. So although I published very little about these things, also the influence in text and context book, there are many pages which are very, very formal. Mm -hmm. And I remember later when it was translated in French, <coughs> when it was translated in Spanish, in Latin America, where I traveled later very, very often, they complained that the book was just so complicated because of all this formal stuff. Uh -huh. But in that in that book, which I didn't have yet in my dissertation, was much more a development towards defining things like coherence of discourse and so on. The um, that dissertation was still half literature, half a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. But the idea was to do a, gr a grammar of text. But the book on text and context is much more sophisticated because also there's much more formal stuff in how to define actually discourse coherence. Mm -hmm. So that was a very important necessary step. Uh, reading lots of literature and logic, and I knew about formal logic and I knew about formal semantics, things which have an influence until today, because if I want to explain something on semantics to students, I have this background also in informal stuff. So okay. that's an important step in my development. But at the same time, I was interested in cognitive psychology and I was read, I began to read in cognitive psychology. Uh -huh. And when I was doing that, I found a guy in the United States who had been for the first time doing cognitive psychology of discourse uh, called Walter Kinch. He, okay. he came from Europe, I think from Romania, mm -hmm. but he was a, already a quite a well-known linguist in, in, in the United States, in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. Uh, and I said, well, um, I would like to, you know, to visit you. So I went to visit him and so on. And it was the beginning of many years of cooperation with him. Mm 
uh, we did a very well-known paper together and also a book on strategies of discourse comprehension. Mm -hmm. But my motivation to look in, in cognitive stuff was the following. I had been developing this notion of macrostructure, mm -hmm. which didn't exist in linguistics. You had you know, local sentences and maybe coherence of sentences, but not a discourse study of whole discourses. So mm -hmm. there was no idea, how do we define not only local coherence of sentences, but right. also the coherence or actually the meaning of a whole text, not just one word or one sentence. So I developed this notion of macrostructure. Mm -hmm. And in linguistics, no one was until no, today. No, not even the bomb was talking no one, about that. No then. one no. was working on mm -hmm. this kind of work. The, the only person who had mentioned, mentioned macrostructure but in a different way was Manfred Bierwisch. Okay. And Manfred Bierwisch was from East, then East Germany, Germany, but he never developed the semantic idea of semantic macrostructure. And I think, okay, if the linguists are not interested, I'm going to look if, with the psychologists. And the psychologists were interested because they were doing experiments on memory of discourse. Mm -hmm. And the only way you could explain why if you give a text, a newspaper article to people, they afterwards only remember no details, but they mm -hmm. only had some gist or general topic, what they remember was the semantic microstructure. So mm -hmm. my theory of semantic microstructure was perfect for them to explain all these kind of things. Okay, wow, well, so, yeah. So very soon, uh -huh. in cognitive psychology, this whole notion of, of, uh, of semantic microstructure had lots of influences because they suddenly had a good definition of the notion, what is the gist or the topic of a discourse. So that's how I entered psychology. Mm -hmm. And since we did this thing together with Walter Kinch, and he did experiments and was theory and a discussion, he went there several times. Mm -hmm. So with his book in 83 on the strategies of discourse comprehension, had a tremendous influence in cognitive psychology and was cited all the time and so on, and had lots of influence. And until today, uh -huh. the ideas of this strategies of discourse comprehension were fundamental. So different from a more formal, structural approach to text and discourse. Right. Instead of saying, okay, these are the structures of text or talk and so on. So we said, no, what we need is how actual people do it. What are actual mental strategies involved in the production or the comprehension of discourse? That was fundamental. So the book was not on structures of discourse for psychology, but it was on the actual mental strategies they did, how to plan, for example, a discourse, how to understand it, and so on. So that book had lots of influence, mm -hmm. and until today, many of these basic principles, they are still valid until today. That was in, after my book on text and context, Mm -hmm. Well, he, yeah, Walter Kinch had seen so my So what year is this, more or less? So this all the 70s, the this 70s. Is the 70s. So my, my dissertation was the 72 text grammar, then the text and context book, which is much more a formal approach to text and also context, mm -hmm. because also no one was working on context. No, I mean, Gumpertz didn't start working on context so much later. Yes, but it was all in the same time. Yes. It was, I mean, Bill above started to work at the end of the 60s, yes. but that was just, you know, and it was, so, that was, you know, sociolinguistics of sounds and so on, not yeah. and, and, and so that came much later when he started to do uh, work on, uh, on uh, black language vernacular, vernacular yeah. and so on and so on, so that only became later. But the 70s was all these, all these people started to think about this kind of thing. So in sociology, you know, of, of course, uh, the people work beginning to work uh, on conversational analysis by the 74. Gumbert's books also, of course, in, in sociolinguistics and, 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 and topics in sociolinguistics also at the same time. Yes. And my more formal book, more or less independent of this kind of thing, was more text and context. And at the same time, I began to be interested in the cognitive psychology stuff about in order to be able to do work on macrostructure. And since I thought it was so important to have this not just in linguistics, I did a big book called Macrostructures, which is for all the all the humanities. So it was on it was on macrostructures in discourse, macrostructures in the mind, and macrostructures of action and interaction. 
So mm -hmm. I said, the only way people can plan, understand, and do complex things is when they take abstraction from the local stuff and construe a global idea, a global idea in their mind, and a global idea in their action and interaction. The only way you can explain all these things is when they have uh, this notion of Marxism. So I wrote before the book with Keats yeah. in eighty. Uh -huh. I did this book on Marxism. So the seventies finished with uh, my book on text and context, which is more formal. Also, the first definition of context, the notion of Marxist structures in linguistics, but also uh -huh. in other disciplines, and then. With Walter Kinch, a much more psychological book on the actual strategies being involved. That's mm -hmm. the 70s. Because that, that was connected to one of the questions I sort of wanted to ask you about, be, of, of what anthropologists were doing at that time in terms of their way of understanding uh, cultural meaning uh -huh. and ideology uh, and um, how that connects to the psychological uh, cognitive psychology that you were trying to develop? Well, I, at that time, I, I don't have a perfect memory of everything I've been reading and was always reading also in, in anthropology and I was interested in cognitive anthropology uh -huh. uh, much later, you know, because there is, there is uh, work on, on um, knowledge about the world and so on. So I was reading a little bit of this kind of thing and later, in 85, I went to the United States uh, to uh, UCSD in, in La Jolla. Yeah. And there, there were, of course, people working on cognitive anthropology, whom mm -hmm. I met at the same time as uh, Alan Sikorel, of course, in, yes. in sociology and so But that is already the 80s. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I read in cultural anthropology. I don't remember each book I've been no. reading, but I was reading these kind of things. But I still did not have explicit much later contacts uh, with people like uh, linguistic uh, and, 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 and Palosa, like Sandra Loranti and, and the whole uh, Eleanor group, Oaks, being, yeah, except yeah. all these people uh, in, in, in California. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and I've, but that's, for, that's much later and also for all kinds of other discussion I had with him. He did also a book in a debate which has something to do also with cognitive psychology and so, but that's, that's another topic. So can we continue with your trajectory from oh, yeah. cognitive psychology? Yes. So let's say many of these things are still there in my mind. And when I write up things, I, I sort of use things I learned many, many years ago. You know, like today, I'm not interested in very much in formal stuff. I would not read books in logic or formal logic and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's it, I learned many things other people never learn. So it's useful always. The same thing, of course, with the, the content of psychology until today. That's, that's always relevant. And I'm not following what's going on every day, but I know what more or less who is doing what. And so, so that, that is the basis of that is all in the 70s. Uh -huh. And in the 80s, at the same time as I was thinking and working with Walter Kinch on this book called The Strategies of Discourse Comprehension, the first step came in areas of more critical stuff mm -hmm. because I became interested in the notion and the, the, uh, the phenomenon of racism in the Netherlands. And the only work in racism in the Netherlands done by people in anthropology and, and sociology and so on. In linguistics, no one, no one was talking about things like prejudice and, and racism and this kind of thing. And I always explained that and I think it's still true I went for the first time in Latin America in the, seven, in the end of the 70s mm -hmm. and I gave lectures in Puerto Rico and in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So that's how I also learned Spanish for the first time. Okay. Uh, and observing how indigenous people were treated in Mexico, for example, uh, I said, this is terrible. But the same thing in Europe happened, as I see, when more and more immigrants came to Holland and to Europe, they were also treated very badly. And there was no linguistic work at all in this kind of thing. Uh -huh. So in the beginning of the 1980s, finishing at the one hand is, is always overlapping stuff. Yes. So one thing, finishing this work with Kinch on the strategies, this is comprehension. I begin to give classes in the university 
on racism and discourse and this particular This candidate. is at the University of Amsterdam. Yes, it was everything at the University of Amsterdam at the beginning of the 1980s, all right? So my, my papers in the 80s were about racism and so on. And then um, uh, I also, I was uh, married to a, a black woman from Suriname uh -huh. and she was working on everyday racism uh, and so on. She, we met in class. Uh -huh. And she was working on her own dis dissertation. She's very famous now in the United States. Uh, and I was working also on discourse and racism and did my first books on prejudice and discourse. And that missed, after the work in cognitive psychology, I was more interested in social psychology of prejudice and reading all this enormous literature on on, on social psychology of identity, social psychology of prejudice. That was my readings at the beginning of the 1980s. And my first books and articles were about social cognition and discourse, prejudice and discourse. My first book in Dutch was on racism in the media. Uh -huh. And that opened mm, all my work on media and, and racism in the press and so on uh, until today. Uh -huh. And another thing was, uh, you know, actually field work I did in Amsterdam, interviewing people uh, about in their neighborhood what they thought about immigrants. Mm -hmm. So my first book in English on that topic is actually uh, on um, discourse and racism. And many books afterwards on the same topic. But the first were actually more ethnographic work, uh -huh. interviewing people in Amsterdam uh, on, the, on immigrants in the neighborhood. And when I went to the United States in 85, I did the same thing in La Jolla, uh, interviewing people about what they thought about immigrants who came from Mexico. And this combined very, very interestingly. So that is until today. So what would you say are the key points about language and racism from that time that you were studying in the Netherlands? And I wanted to know if people were talking about immigration because I was interested in racism. And I was observing that in Holland was racism very obvious against all these immigrants, minorities and so on, and linguists weren't doing anything. So I was interested in, if people talk about immigration and immigrants and then foreign neighbors, how do they do that? I just wanted to know, in my, it was already much closer to let's say linguistic anthropology than to formal linguistics. Uh -huh. much closer to that. So I was interested in the kind of studies they have, you know, all kinds of stuff uh, like um, typical uh, denials, like I'm not a racist, but you know, this kind of stuff. Right. So we had all, I was just discovering all kinds of typical strategies of racist discourse. So, mm -hmm. And since I had all this work also in, in semantics, I was interested in began to be interested also in the ideologies behind that, but again, that's more of the, of the 90s afterwards. So mm -hmm. the polarization between positive representation of ourselves, our group, we, mm -hmm. and negative presentation of the others. So the ideas about the, the ideology behind all these discourses began also, I began to be interested in stuff which was more and more far away from linguistics and more and more multidisciplinary because it was, on the one hand, I was studying discourse all the time. So I was always a discourse analyst since then, right. since the 70s, but interested first in formal linguistics uh, and formal uh, logic, and then in cognitive psychology, then in social psychology, and of course talk, working on racism in sociology, anthropology, and all the social sciences, because that's where they're studying these kinds of things. The linguists didn't do it. So I did from my point of view, and that's how all these things began to be connected. Okay, okay. And I, I can see from this trajectory, this need for filling in gaps that the discipline of linguistics was lacking and, and yes. the gaps of literature, the gaps in linguistics. And I always, as I said, from the beginning of the French teacher, who was terrible, uh -huh. I said, I can do that better. Uh -huh. I was reading stuff in English. They said, no, they don't do that kind of thing. So I was in the seminar of the and said, okay, it's interesting, the semantique structural, and, but it doesn't add up linguistically. And so on. I said, one can do that better. So I went to read other kinds of things and did my, so constantly 
I had this idea, let me do this in another way or better. So constantly the inspiration also from combining stuff which people didn't do. Mm -hmm. People stayed in linguistic, only linguistic, and didn't read book in psychology. Mm -hmm. And I always read books in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And if I explain many of my things, is that if you, the new developments in a discipline nearly are, nearly always are actually combining dif different disciplines. I mean, it's not just discover, discover new things in phonology, maybe, but it's more, much more interesting when you relate it to other kinds of Well, things. it challenges exactly. uh, the, the, the principles of the discipline, no? And yes. And when you're a young scholar, you don't dare do it. You can only do it at a certain stage. Well, but yeah. I always want to do something else. You know, uh -huh. I, I could not stay just in literature. I had to do linguistic study of literature, so I became a linguistic. And when I was in linguistics, I, there's no things like discourse, so mm -hmm. let's look at discourse. And then working on linguist, discourse grammar, I said, but there's no notion of microstructure, so let's look in psychology. Mm -hmm. And once I was in psychology, the cognitive psychology doesn't explain prejudice and racism, so I had to read in social psychology, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, you always, the new stuff you always find when you combine things. Mm -hmm. And it is very important. That's why since the 70s, my work always has to be multidisciplinary. It's, mm -hmm. it's never one, just one thing. Mm -hmm. It always is also even logic, you know, and, and formal stuff be it, to explain other things. Uh -huh. Which later, when I was also becoming interested in in artificial intelligence and forms that in, in cognitive psychology, cognitive science, of course the cognitive and the formal stuff helped a lot to understand kind of things. So when for my work in psychology I started to read stuff in artificial intelligence, for example, on scripts, you know, uh -huh. of, of the famous uh, said the, the scripts, plans, goals and understanding book of of uh, of uh, Lake of and uh, no, sorry, of Shank and Abelson, the Shank uh -huh. and Abelson book, but it's also 77. So all these things went at the same time, par in parallel. Uh -huh. So I was starting to read stuff in cognitive psychology and was reading and working with Walter Kinch, but at the same time, people in artificial, beginning of artificial intelligence, uh, like Roger Shank in yeah. linguistic um, and Abelson in, 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 so, in social psychology, they began to work on notions like script and so on, which are relevant until today. Mm -hmm. So, began, when you begin to be, when you see how all these things are hang together, you understand much better how it works. Yes. So I could not just work on just text. Very soon, until today, it has to be about the mind. So I can never forget many of the explanations of discourse have to do with things in the mind, and much of the work later to work on context, to work on knowledge, to work on yeah. all these things depend on that kind of development. So I wanted to, so you moved from racism to knowledge to, well, first you moved to ideology? Yes. Yeah, so let's say, and from the beginning of the set, the 80s, I was interested in racism and in papers and the books on racism in Holland and then also in other countries, also in Latin America and so on. So from that moment on, I was saying, okay, what we do is not just text grammar, mm -hmm. it is discourse analysis, you know, discourse analysis. And only later we said, it's not just analysis, it's also theory and so on application. Uh -huh. So we call it discourse studies, but that was much later. Uh -huh. But then in the 1980s, of course, I discovered and met uh, my great friend, Ruth Wardak. Okay. Uh, First, our own work uh, in many fields also, but soon we team together. But she was already working. She was in the in 1980s, and I was, I was met, I was meeting uh, Norman Fairclough in, in England. Uh -huh. And in the beginning of the 1990s, we had a meeting in Amsterdam of all these people and critical discourse studies together. And we founded this movement of critical discourse studies in a meeting in Amsterdam, uh, which was 25 years later, celebrated again in Amsterdam, getting all these people together. So we went there. So there was Theo van Leeuwen, 
and um, uh, Gunther Kress yes. and Rod Waldark and me and all these people together in Amsterdam and that's how it started and then later we met every one or two years in another city in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that your thinking was also developing, being developed by other people like Perkoff and Ruth Brodak and, and Theo Lanoon. Yes, because we all, we, all these people were doing their own stuff. So did I. For example, I had much more than they, this cognitive psychology background. Uh -huh. So, and doing the critical stuff which has to do with prejudice and racism and so, I had more cognitive psychology and for example, Fairclub had much more a neo-Marxist background in uh, political science and this kind, which I didn't have at all. Uh -huh. You know, I, I knew about it, but I didn't do that. And Ruth Waldach was both in women's studies in part, because she was working on gender. Yes. And, but she was mostly also in the, and that's how we got together in anti-Semitism. So okay. she was interested in anti-Semitism and I in racism. So we did a book together, which is published in, in, in an Austrian publishing house called Racism at the Top, mm -hmm. analyzing how people in parliament, uh, in various countries of Europe, talked about immigration. So that's how we met. She working on anti-Semitism anti and I working on racism. That's how we did many things together. Uh -huh. And that was in 1990s. Because what I noticed that there's kind of uh, making the point about what to call critical discourse, whether it's critical discourse studies or critical discourse analysis, and people talk about different schools in the field. Yes, that's unfortunate. I mean, I I, I hate, wanted to ask you about I this. I hate that. I hate yeah. that because it's also very typical in Latin America, uh -huh. where you have schools or what they say in Spanish, lineas. Yes. Linea de investigación. That was, you had the linea francesa, and the linea norteamericana, the linea alemana, etc. I hate that. So all uh -huh. these lines, of schools, approaches. It's divisive, until, no. It is divisive and it's terrible because you should mutually learn from each other and inspire each other. And it, I'm not saying that everything go together because I also am critical and I'm not hiding that for no one. I'm critical, for example, of systemic linguistics uh -huh. for several reasons, but I'm critical for purely theoretical reasons, not because I know them very well, I publish them in the journals, I admire their work, uh, think of the best people in this field like Theo van Leeuwen in, in multimodal discourse analysis. These are people I admire, I learn from them every day. But the linguistics behind it, I have criticized for many, it's published, it's published stuff so people know about it. Uh, I don't like for several reasons, which is more technical. I don't need to go into that now. But let's say that the, for me, essential is to be able to work together with people in different disciplines and not have different schools. So people usually, they say, yes. So I am the school more of cognitive, social cognitive uh -huh. stuff, because I had that kind of uh, uh, background and Ruth Wodak, because also she used to be married to a, a, a guy, a North American guy who is a historian, uh, and this work also uh, was inspired by history, which I didn't have at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why she had something like a discourse historical approach, because her, so her inspiration was more history mm -hmm. and explaining, for example, anti Semitism through an historical analysis of. Uh, anti-Semitic uh, Semitic work and developments in Russia and so that was her background and Norman Fackler had more um, a background in typical European neo-Marxist developments mm -hmm. in political science mm -hmm. so we had different approaches but we were all working on something which we soon call discourse studies in the beginning it's all discourse analysis because that notion already existed since I think 52 when uh, Zelig Harris wrote yeah. a paper on discourse analysis, which has very little to do with discourse. With what, what you're doing with this book. Listen, do you want to take a little break? Okay, so we're ready to yes. start again. Okay. Where I want to follow up on... Were the things you wanted to talk about which you didn't mention, what was that? Of the 70s or something like, well, we'll find it later. That doesn't matter. Uh, you go on with what, you, what your plan was. Well, I mean, I, I, had, uh, I had several 
several sections that I wanted to ask you about, but um, I'm, I'm interested in how your trajectory went from racism to ideology uh -huh. and knowledge and yes. so where that, you are today, yes. Okay, so we are now, let's say, in the 90s, and that was, let's say, the foundation of critical discourse studies as an orientation of work in discourse analysis, discourse studies. Mm -hmm. So many disciplines, uh, not linguistics only, but also anthropology, sociology, psychology, all uh, disciplines in humanities and social sciences were interested in any aspect of discourse. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had conversation analysis, which was all over as well, but also argumentation analysis, narrative analysis. I mean, it was all over in many different disciplines. Mm -hmm. It's not just, definitely not only linguistics, and definitely not grammar. So it was already discourse linguistics, which already was there. So that was the, that was developed in the 70s, consolidated in the 80s, all over, and in the 80s we were saying, yes, that's nice, but we also need not only looking at discourse, but also relating discourse with society. And that people like Fairclough and Ruth Waldeck and many other people in many disciplines were doing too. Uh -huh. And that began, on the one hand, more the cultural kinds of things in anthropology, and uh -huh. that's still today in linguistic anthropology. Uh, and our view, a more European view, was more of the critical aspect. Of course, influenced also by the Kritische Schule of the, uh, you know, Ruth Waldeck was interested, of course, in the Kritische Schule, and of course, this this whole uh, idea of social criticism, mm -hmm. uh, which of course uh, was very important also for Ruth Rodek in the German uh, part of this whole tradition of critical discourse studies. So the critical discourse studies had these various kinds of uh, inspiration, and that was sort of beginning in 1980s and consolidated in the 1990s mm -hmm. with his meeting in Amsterdam. So that was in the beginning of the 1990s. And within this whole field, of course, uh, people had different ideas of doing different kinds of things. And one mm -hmm. of the things which became obvious in my work on racism was this notion of ideology. You know, this idea of, and through my reading in, in social psychology, uh, for example, questions of group identity, group relationships. Uh -huh. uh, so, of course, you had this famous school of social psychology of, of Henry Tatchfield yes. uh, in England. Right. And I read all this work, and, and much of my work in racist discourse was also inspired by this particular kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this kind of polarization between in groups and out groups, which is experiments and many of uh, uh, other, his own students. In many countries had it so and I found that very important because I was always looking at the discourse stuff and noticed that talking about immigrants both in Amsterdam and in, in La Jolla where I also lived uh, I no noticed this polarization between emphasizing the good things of our group and emphasizing the bad things of the other group so I developed this whole notion of what they call the ideological square like emphasize our good stuff and emphasizing their bad stuff mm -hmm. and de-emphasizing our bad stuff mm -hmm. so we never talk about our prejudices and de-emphasizing their good stuff so mm -hmm. the contribution of the other group for our culture etc is also mitigated and these particular kind of general strategies you find at all levels of discourse mm -hmm. you find it in the topics that people talk about in the images mm -hmm. in the metaphors etc all structures of discourse can be explained by this polarization. Would you give a cognitive status yes. to Yes, so the idea was how to explain this ideology. So racist discourse obviously is inspired by, based on racist ideology, in the same way as sexist discourse is um, inspired by sexist ideology, and but also the other way around. Anti-racist discourse is also uh, inspired by anti-racist ideologies. So this mm -hmm. whole thing, this polarization we have in our head mm -hmm. to distinguish between us and them, mm -hmm. uh, you find at all levels of discourse. So you can find them in in the in the multimodal stuff of images, in mm -hmm. the metaphors, in the uh, word you know lexical selection. Mm -hmm. All aspects of discourse are controlled by this particular kind of thing. 
Mm -hmm. And because I had this whole background in cognitive psychology, I always also wanted to relate, not just ideology, mm -hmm. but I wanted to relate ideology with discourse in the theoretical way that you can explain. Mm -hmm. That's not obvious because typically what people do is they they analyze discourse and they say, okay, this is an expression of power and so that was our idea in critical discourse studies. But how do you relate all these things in discourse to society? Mm -hmm. And we never had an idea that something was missing because discourse structures, a story, an argumentation, a talk, a conversation, is a very different kind of structure uh, than the social structures like racism and discrimination we were studying at the same time. How do you relate that? Mm -hmm. So I construed a theory relating all these things in a systematic way. So mm -hmm. how, how structures of discourse are related to specific kind of cognitive structures like mental models, mm -hmm. which was a notion I already had developed with Walter Kinch in our book of 83. Mm -hmm. And these mental models are about personal experiences. And then when these are being shared by other people, they become social attitudes, for example, about immigration, and the social attitudes are about immigration are related to this fundamental aspect of ideology. So you have a racist ideology, an attitude about immigration or other aspects of immigrants and, and minorities and so on, that is related to personal mental models of people, and mm -hmm. these personal mental models can be, so, can be uh, related to the structure of discourse of people talking about these kind of things. So you yeah, have discourse structures, personal mental models, socially shared attitudes, and socially shared uh, ideologies. And you have mm -hmm. racist ideologies, uh, and, fem and sexist ones, and, and uh, uh, militarist ones, and so on. But my point of the theory of ideology was that it is a very general notion, it's not just negative. Mm -hmm. That comes from Marx, you know, that it's negative. Right. But the idea that ideologies are general, also, you have uh, also feminist ideologies, not, neg not necessarily negative. Mm -hmm. and, and other people in the, in the whole history of the theory of ideology, for example, Karl Mannheim did a book on, on, on ideology and utopia. Mm -hmm. And he called these, pos these positive ideologies, he called them utopia. Let's say a feminist ideology, or in his time, of course, a socialist ideology mm -hmm. was a utopia. Mm -hmm. But basically, they're also ideologies. They control also specific kinds of attitudes, for example, about immigration or about abortion. Mm -hmm. And they also control what people individually think and do and also what they speak. So we have this whole relationship between one and the other. Mm -hmm. Now, and that was my book of the end of the 90s on, on ideology. And ideology. And I thought that was so important. I want to do a whole series of books on ideology. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, but ideology, we need something else which is not there yet. So in order to do a real multidisciplinary series of books on ideology, one was about ideology in general, which I wrote, which is published, yes. also, in Sp also yes. in Spanish. Then I said, well, we now need a book on uh, the, the cognitive psychology of ideology and one on the sociology of ideology, and one on the discourse and ideology, which mm -hmm. I never wrote, by La Lettre book in, in Spanish. Right. So I hold plan a book, but once I started to read about discourse and knowledge, mm -hmm. that became a separate project, because no one was doing that. Mm -hmm. Because I read much work on epistemology and, and philosophy and so on and, and so on and so on. And so, in order to do this in a different way, I began to study on, the, on knowledge and I think, my goodness, the basis of all cognition we have is not ideology, the basis of all cognition is knowledge. Mm -hmm. We all have knowledge about all kinds of things and only ideological groups have different kinds of things. So all everyone here in Spain has a general knowledge about what happens in the world and so on, and specific groups are socialist and feminist and racist mm -hmm. and anti-racist. So this is more of groups of people but what we all have in common, the so-called epistemic community, mm -hmm. we can only communicate because we have all these shared knowledge, knowledge, and shared shared knowledge. knowledge. So the notion of shared knowledge is basically, and that's why I wrote this book on discourse and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's relevant until today because 
many more political texts show all these ideological structures, this square, this ideological square of emphasizing and de-emphasizing our group and their group. So that's mm -hmm. the ideological structure. But the basis of all these kinds of things are mm -hmm. much more fundamental, and that's knowledge. And discourse has an enormous amount of things which depend on knowledge we have about kinds of things. And even in So is there are there particular kinds of knowledge that you consider more important to understand ideologies? No, first of all first of all we need to know how knowledge is in our how it is in our head. So we still, until today, we don't have a good theory of the actual structures of knowledge in our head. We have ideas of scripts, of hierarchies, uh, categories, and so on. Since the 70s, there are people working in cognitive psychology and, co and, uh, and cognitive science on the structures of knowledge. But basically, we have very little idea about this huge amount of knowledge we have about the world, everything we know. Which determines what we do, what we see. Yes, what, everything. I mean, socialization. Everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. everything. Our everyday life, our communication, our actions, our discourse, all depends on this knowledge. And so this whole notion of presupposition, have explanations in, in that kind of thing. So the first problem is a good theory of the structure of knowledge in our head. There are only fragments of theory about that we still don't know. And of course, since nowadays people more and more do neuropsychology, it's not a question of in our minds, but also in our brain. So we now know, for example, that specific kinds of knowledge, for example, about cars, is not just what they look like, that's a visual aspect which I hear, but also the noise they make, and so that's somewhere else. And also, for example, the experience of driving a car, mm -hmm. as I said, is another part of the brain. So the, the knowledge we have our in, of, about us is like embodied, multimodal knowledge, which is distributed in all kinds of parts of our, in our brain. That's the only thing we know. But the details of this, we have no idea, mm -hmm. as, as far as I know. So that's, um, you know, therefore brain science related to you know, neuropsychology and so to discourse analysis are fundamental, because the idea is if you do a systematic analysis of discourse, does this give you an idea about structures of the knowledge in our head, yes or no? Well, we know that of macro structures a little bit, but many other things we did, we simply don't have an idea. So we know about scripts mm -hmm. and these ideas in, in cognitive science about how things are organized also in discourse or visiting a restaurant, you know how to mm -hmm. do things in a restaurant. We know have this thing and these structures also appear in storytelling and so on. But that's, that's it. And for example, we know this a little bit in cognitive science, but no one in cognitive science ever spoke about ideology. No. Because ideology was for political scientists. I mean, all the books we have here on ideology, there's not a single book, not a single book about the cognitive structures of ideology. Simply, they never did. Mm -hmm. So the cognitive psychologists were, the cognitive psychologists were not interested in ideology. There's not a single book about that. And the people in political science who were interested in ideology, also my colleagues like Tarkla, they were not interested in cognition. So there were always a stupid gap between all these particular kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I have a general idea how things go, and I have some about specific things, I have very specific predictions, which also later were confirmed in, in cognitive psychology and experiments, but details, no. Mm -hmm. For example, if you ask me, I have an idea about the study of ideology, which is also in this book, and it has to do with identity, norms and values, and all kinds of things. The basic structures of ideology we know more or less from this course and others, what they look like. But if I then go to more specific things, like for example, uh, the attitude people have in the United States about abortion, mm -hmm. okay? Big topic every day in the news until today. Now, what is the cognitive structure of someone who is against abortion uh, rights. Mm -hmm. Because that's, of course, a fundamental social stuff, you know, dividing the role of the United States until today. And so what I'm interested in, interested in is what is exactly, what have happens exactly in their heads? It, what is this kind of anti-abortion attitude and how is it related to action and discourse? 
I can study their discourse, I can interview them, and I can do this kind of thing, and the books about that. Mm -hmm. But how things are in the mind, we have no idea. So many things about, let's say, the social cognition behind the people talking about or against abortion, mm -hmm. we have no idea. There are books, many books in social psychology about attitudes, mm -hmm. but no one does an analysis of how that. these attitudes in their heads. So there are many, there are many, many, many gaps, you mm -hmm. know, and I cannot do them, all of them, but I've, I've tried to do some of them. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, so, Tum, you've given us a, an explanation of your trajectory, which is incredibly interesting. Um, what would you say has been your major contribution? What are you proud of, of what you've contributed to the field of critical discourse study? Wow. What do you feel good about? What do you like? What do you think is important or has had an I impact? I can only say what I think is important. And we're not saying that I contribute, contribute to that specifically, but I think it's important. First of all, <clears throat> I think already from the 70s, if I think also about combining the history, uh -huh. the idea that you need always to work across disciplines. I mean, that's crucial. You cannot just do one thing in one discipline. All new ideas, everything we do about language communication, but also other kinds of things, mm -hmm. even other disciplines. If you just do one thing, it's always very limited. Mm -hmm. and I am now also in a debate with people, and my new book I'm now writing, uh, it's about uh, the disc of the social movements. Uh -huh. And because many people in social movements do fantastic stuff about social movements, uh, they even sometimes talk about discourse, or the data they have, sometimes the data they have simply discourses, but they ne never read a book on discourse analysis. And then how can, that be, how can it be possible? So they talk about frames, mm -hmm. and you ask them, what are these frames? And they imitate or uh, say, well, Kaufman talks about frame analysis. Mm -hmm. And they say, so what is your frame analysis? You talk about discourse, but you never look at discourse. So what is, what is exactly this discourse structures which correspond to frames? They have no idea. Mm -hmm. Because they never did a book outside of the old field of sociology. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a very critical paper already years ago when I lived in Rio de Janeiro called, uh, called Analyzing Frame Analysis. Mm -hmm. And that was now published in a special issue of discourse studies. I asked them, this is a critical study of studies of frame analysis. What do you think? You know, and so I want to stimulate this new book I'm now writing, actually mm -hmm. I have the first version, uh, to stimulate people in social movements uh, work uh, to do also more work on discourse analysis and forget this vague notion of frame, which doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Because in the paper, what I did is I took 150 articles and I looked how all these authors tried to define frame and they talked, all of them, about a different kind of thing. So one talked about norms and values, another about aims, about many other aspects of, of social movements. This was not an, so there was no such a thing. You could not identif identify a frame in text because everyone was speaking as about a different kind of thing. It's okay now. If you want to do that, do simply do learn from, we learn from you and you learn from us how to do discourse analysis. So there was a whole debate about that. And this now going up, the number is the issue about the frame analysis uh -huh. is just being proposed now. Wow. So I hope this will be a big debate. For it's, Kaufman's anniversary. Exactly. <laughs> so that that is, I hope a big debate in in sociology about whether or not frame analysis is useful. I'm not saying that analysis is very interesting. What they did as sociologists is interesting. But once they start about frames, they had no idea. Mm -hmm. it's simply, so I had a whole issue specifically about this kind of thing. What I want to say about this kind of thing is my main aim in the new book as well. And of all these other things, the well, and all these books, the, the, already the book on microstructure of 1980, then the book on ideology of 98, uh, and the book on books and context of the end of 2008 and 10, and so on and so, and now this new book and the book on knowledge as well. All these books are multidisciplinary. Mm 
is not just linguistic, but physical analysis and the social sciences, anthropology, sociology, psychology. It mm -hmm. has to be not, that's the main thing. If you talk about discourse, it has to be multidisciplinary, the same with language. And I say to them too, listen, in order to do a good work on experimenting psychology, read also something about discourse analysis before you do work, you know, experimental work with this one. And I say, I tell them too, I learn from you, now learn also from us. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second main thing for me very much important, but that was only late, at the end of the 70s, when I was already doing lots of discourse analysis and calling that discourse analysis and and poetry analysis, all these kind of things I already did in the 60s and 70s, there was still nothing critical about it. it wasn't the, I had discourse as a fundamental notion, and I had uh, cognition as a fundamental notion, but the, th the third element missing was society. Mm -hmm. There was no social analysis, there was no societal analysis. I was not talking about racism or sexism or social structure and so nothing I knew about Leboeuf mm -hmm. and about ethnicity and language use, but that was not actually about racism and so on. That came later. Mm -hmm. So the second main thing I, I'm interested in and wanted to contribute is to understand very fundamental notions of racism. And then my last books are actually saying, listen, critical discourse analysis should not just be about power and abuse of power, but it also should be about resistance against power. So my last books are on anti-racist discourse. So mm -hmm. I wrote two books, one about Brazil, about Brazil and the history of anti-racist discourse in Brazil. And I wrote a book for Cambridge University Press on anti-racist discourse, which is basically a history going back to 2000 years ago mm -hmm. to anti-slavery writings and, te and, and discourses and talk uh, two years. And then of course it goes through, uh, you know, racist discourse and anti-racist discourse about Mexico and, 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 sla and slave people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course the whole history in the United States, you know, beginning with the Quakers, uh, of, you know, opposing uh, slavery uh, and a whole long history uh, finally also of course went to the civil rights movement mm -hmm. until Black Lives Matter. So mm -hmm. it's a history of 2000 years of anti-racist anti -racist discourse and we did the same thing for the United States and Europe with a big chapter also of the beginning of anti-anti-Semitism. So I did the history of how German Jewish uh, scholars began to analyze critically anti-Semitism in the 19th century until the Second World, World War. So I was for many, many years, my last years of work before I began with this work on the um, discourse of social movement has been about anti-racist discourse and its history. And these are also my first his history books because I, the, all the, the other dimension I didn't have at all, and Ruth Warwick, yes, mm -hmm. was talking about history. And I want, so what is this history? Where did it all begin? Protesting against slavery and so on. I know about this now because I've read all these, well, many of these studies uh, of also black people in the United States and so on, protesting against slavery and in Brazil as well. Mm -hmm. So I have also the history of South America and, and Brazil against this and the United States and, and Europe with all the anti-racist movements in Europe until today. Mm -hmm. So. The fundamentally, fundamental idea is that using discourse analysis to do a systematic study of a very fundamental social problem, which is racism, and we see it every day uh, today in um, polarization, right-wing uh, groups in Spain, a, 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 a political party, Vox, uh, what happens in the United States polarization, uh, with Trump and Trumpism and populism, uh, lots of racism going on there until today. So I want to understand these relationship between racist discourse, racist society, and racist thinking, this triangle of mm -hmm. discourse 
cognition <coughs> and society, but also celebrating and analyzing and understanding all the discourse against it, not just analyzing racist discourse, but also how the people, other side, the other course, side, yeah. exactly. So the other question. So I was also much more, much inspired for my work on anti-racism in feminism because feminism has the same thing. Mm -hmm. It is against uh, macho and machismo and so on and so on. Uh, so in the same way, I uh, see feminism as a macro movement all over the world in many forms. Also anti-racism is also a macro movement uh, uh, all over the world. And from this idea of a movement, I moved to this general study in social sciences about, um, about social movements. So, especially work in a multidisciplinary way, uh, uh, way, are not afraid of reading books in other, other disciplines and learn from them uh -huh. and trying to inspire them as well. Focus on a very fundamental social problem like for example racism and relate them to all kinds of problems which happen today about fake news and populism and, and the extreme right and mm -hmm. so on and trying to explain why is it that for example the Santis in Florida is doing these terrible things uh, saying terrible things and trying to for, for get books and you know and and so on and I try to explain why this is so you know this historical way of the development, for example, in the 1960s, more and more liberalism in all kinds of things. You have feminism, you have the hippie movement, you have the civil rights movement, all these different ways since the 60s of being freer, more modern, more advanced. So you have now gay marriage, which you didn't have, all these things. And you now see that all these successes and all these disciplines of mm -hmm. euthanasia and so on and so on, mm -hmm. People who are conservatives in many countries, also in the United States, they simply cannot handle this anymore. And they become more and more, and since the 90s, what happens is their reaction becomes more and more violent. And people like Trump in the United States, or Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, they do that in, because they have more power, so also people feel more, you know, uh, legitimated to this kind of thing. So to explain, what happens today in the world, uh, in the United States, in Europe, in Brazil, and so on, to explain this in terms of ideologies, which are, that's why I call the extreme right also as a reactionary right, because you can explain it if you do an analysis of the history of liberalism in, mm -hmm. the, 20, in the 21st century, you can explain that all the things of Vox in Spain, for example, you can read and analyze as reactions against developments, developments of liberalism. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a book in the United States, fantastic book, it's called The Cultural Backlash, and that's exactly mm -hmm. what it is. That there are two, uh, two social, no, political scientists uh, who have re uh, read, uh, read this book to explain, they do it in terms of uh, political choices, parties, and so on in Europe and the United mm -hmm. States, and so on. And I'm interested in this paper, new paper, explaining all these things in terms of discourse. So I, I read, analyzed, and compared the the um, um, party programs in of the extreme right in Chile, in Spain, in Holland, and in Sweden. I happen to read all these languages. That's also handy. So I could compare all these um, programs. And I could explain all these things in terms of this, what they did for political mm -hmm. science, I could do in discourse analysis. It's very fascinating. So the third aspect of my work, I would say, is applying what I've learned on racism and anti-racism also in understanding how society today explains what's going, what's going on. You know, why is it that the Supreme Court in the United States suddenly sort of reverts uh, you know, on uh, Roe versus Wade and so on. Why is that? And you can explain that in terms also of a reaction against liberal ideologies which, beginning, which were beginning to dominate and which now also even when women have more power in society, conservative, traditional men don't like that at all. So you can explain many of these kinds of things also on abortion and many other things. Uh, 
we can explain by this kind of socio-political ideological structures in society. So that's how I understand these things by analyzing this kind of thing. And my work is also always on analyzing these courses, but together with political science and social sciences. So these are the main the main things um, of and, and being not only multidisciplinary but also international. It's not mm -hmm. just here, it's also in Brazil and it's also in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's necessarily international. Can I ask you what you think about the role of the economy in, in your thinking and in shaping these much kinds less. of mental frames? Much, much less. So for example, where, for example, Norman Fairclough would be much closer to political economy, you know, Marxism, neo-Marxism, and, and, and so on and on so today. Mm -hmm. So if you now, if you do, let's say, try to do an analysis of capitalism, that kind of thing, much less. I'm interested, for example, yes, so Piketty in France wrote yes. this book on capital, yes. on capital, which is a fascinating book, and he did a book afterwards on ideology and so yes. on. So, yes. so I read this book too, because I was interested in ideology. Yes, I know all these kind of things, because I've been studying the, the ideology style of that. So, I am not a specialist at all in economy, and I read, of course, Piketty because I think he's fascinating, and, read, and I, I, I learned a lot of what he has been doing, but I don't know if I want to do, let's say, the, the political economy and the analysis of, of capitalism. The only aspects I have are things which are closer to cultural language, communication, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I have not been talking much about today about my work in communication, but I always have been interested in basically three kinds of text. Political discourse, mm -hmm. always. So I have many books on, on political discourse, on parliamentary debates, and so on, many articles as well. Uh, also my work on context was about Tony Blair's uh, speeches in parliament oh, and so on. Yes. I'm interested in textbooks and education. So I've been writing some books and other articles about education because these textbooks are the only obligatory texts in society. Mm -hmm. There's no other one, apart from the Bible maybe, you had to read, but these students have to, have to learn these books. And my third aspect was the media. So since the middle of the 80s, I've always been interested in media and I did books on, on this, uh, news as discourse until today. Media discourse is always fundamental in many, many of my papers until today. Mm -hmm. So also in the book on uh, social movement discourse also is applied to a movement uh, called a Refugees Welcome, mm -hmm. you know, this whole movement of, 19, of 2015 and afterwards. And I not only analyze the interviews with volunteers, mm -hmm. but also media messages, uh, debates in parliament, again, several types of discourse, so always political discourse, media discourse, uh, and educational discourse textbooks. That's the, the three areas I always uh, sort of focused on, I, yeah. on this idea because these are also the discourses I call the discourse of the of the of the of the symbolic elites. Mm -hmm. The symbolic elites are the elites which control public discourse yes. and it's political discourse, mm -hmm. educational discourse, and media discourse. Mm -hmm. Now these things, what people learn is from these three. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the idea where ideologies come from, where prejudice comes from, and so on. So that's the idea how these particular things. So I try to do many, many, many things, but it's sort of there is some logic in it. Yes, you know? yes, no, the logic is been very nicely explained. Um, perhaps to think about finishing, I'd like to ask you about the future uh. <laughs> of critical discourse studies um, in terms of where you think it's going, not only in terms of topics, but also in terms of the way it's practiced. As I said, I'm very much interested in education. Uh -huh. So I think that it's crucial that from this age, mm -hmm. uh, children learn about language communication and be critical.
critical society that they learn they should not come out of high school without being able to critically read an article in the newspaper or today in social media. Mm -hmm. So we didn't talk about social media at all, but obviously critical discourse analysis has to be and is being applied more and more in social media analysis and say, so where is this going? So I need all this knowledge we now have about, do, about language, mm -hmm. cognition, society and how all these things come together that students are able to learn to read in the same way we had Latin and Greek uh, trying to understand uh, Homer Logic, and so on yeah. or, or other kind of thing in the same way students should be able to be independent critical readers of the kinds of discourse they are confronted with that's from the point of view of a discourse analyst because that is there all the time so if they are hooked to their mobile phone the whole day that they know what they are reading and they're always critical and they never take it for granted so if i think of one application of critical discourse analysis is to be able to recognize and resist fake news and so on mm -hmm. that's absolutely crucial because otherwise it goes from from bad to worse you know so that's very important um that's one that's the question of the application of this kind of thing in society in basically in education but not only students but all the teachers have to be educated to be able to do that you can have this wonderful idea and that you can say the students and the textbook should be like this but you need teachers also so you should begin a university to teach the teachers to be to this particular kind of thing mm -hmm. so it's not just them but also in our universities we should have the kind of programs and subjects and MAs and PhDs. What we do here in the center is educate uh, PhDs to do discourse analysis in general, with the people from different disciplines, but also a, a way of doing a critical study of discourse in, in the perspective of more political science or, or social psychology or recognizing prejudice and so on. A, crit a multiple multidisciplinary way of critical analysis to teach teachers to be like that so that they can teach to write the textbooks mm -hmm. and teach in schools so that this whole way from the university to the school will be fundamental mm -hmm. so that's what that's one of of the, ap the main application the same thing obviously obviously is also for the educational journalists mm -hmm. because if the newspapers don't change and if the the uh, all people are responsible for public discourse through all kinds of media, also social media. And so, if they don't change, never it won't. They just they should also be educated in this way. Mm -hmm. And I did a study once comparing what goes on in different countries uh, in educational journalists mm -hmm. because I was always interested in media, and I found that, for example, there was not a single study in the world comparing the United States. Latin America, Europe, Australia, and so on, I, not all countries, but many, many countries, there was not a single department of Department of Communication which had one single class about racism and the press. Not a single one. So I think, my goodness, if the journalists don't even educate this way, there was some on gender and news, that, yes. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, feminism always go one step ahead where racism still wasn't because racism don't want to talk about. But many women have m more power, they can push that. But black people don't have that kind of power to push that. So it is changing, but very slowly. So I say that is very, very important. That's the part of the education and application. Education, mm -hmm. media, the, the knowledge I know. I know less about politics, but of course, all, all politicians would have this kind of knowledge, would also be fantastic. That's the, the application of this work in different areas of society. Then I would say the pure academic theoretical stuff. There's so many things we now know. I just mentioned all that's now happening, you know, in neuropsychology. And we all we have now ways of, you know, manipulating machines with our minds mm -hmm. or say with our brains and so on. <coughs> The fact that we still don't have a general theory of the structures of knowledge in the mind, mm 
that's is incredible mm -hmm. it's the most fundamental so we know a lot about the universe and you know more and more with the new telescope and so on and so on. but if you think about the structure of the brain and as it is related to the structure of knowledge no idea if you ask you do let's say we have a meeting of all people in the best people in the world who know about cognition and we say now okay what we want to know is you tell me what happens in the in the brain of a feminist or a racist or an anti-racist how is this structured how does it work well you know? we're starting to get chatbots <laughs> exactly is... so that's one that's one thing so uh one of these applications because they don't have an idea but i use this kind of thing and i had a conversation with chatbot, with chatbot etc he had no idea about conversation at all <laughs> it was very funny they know a lot of things okay. because if i say give me uh something about uh, discourse analysis and discourse analysis we give a reasonable not perfect and makes mistakes we get a reasonable basically it's spoken it's spoken google you know basically yeah you know and it's very first but if you want a normal conversation they have no idea mm -hmm. because they never these guys engineers they never read that book on conversation analysis so they mm -hmm. have no idea about this kind of thing so as chomsky said in a critical comment on this they have no idea about the structure of language at all it's okay. just it's the same thing as saying making a photocopy that the photocopier is intelligent well, what is Ch i haven't read this article by chomsky on chatbot read it find it in google Wait. oh it's in google okay fine <laughs> <laughs> yes well he's right because he has he is right they have no idea about the fundamental ideas about language and they have no idea the fundamental aspects of discourse and I, I had a chat with them, with the machine. Uh -huh. Tell me about discourse coherence. Tell me about that. So they get very something very, so basically how they pass is a first year student telling these things, which is more or less right. Uh -huh. But I, yesterday in a conversation with people, uh, with PhD students said, but at the level of PhD, you wouldn't pass. <laughs> because right. the details they don't get right. <laughs> right, no. right. So, if I ask them, tell me the theory about coherence, and I did a couple of these kind of things, they have a sort of idea, but not really very explicit. Uh -huh. I mean, the real, the real theoretical notions of discourse coherence, they have no idea. So we need more than information to understand the structure, the mental structure. But that's an application in, in, in artificial intelligence, which is going forward, and they will learn a lot, as, but at this moment it's still very very limited but if you think is what i would see as a future of my work is to to relate this idea always language and discourse which is the most humane of humanity language and communication and so on related of course with all structures of society with power resistance oppression discrimination racism sexism and all racism things. exactly and at the same time related what goes on in our heads because it's people are not just speaking and not just act, acting but also thinking mm -hmm. so if you don't understand what goes on here you cannot really connect discourse and society because they're different kinds of structures the only way they're connected is through our heads we produce discourse with our head and we understand society with our head and we we walk in a, in a, in a demonstration that's a social act the only way we can do that and talk is through our head so yeah, this, well, language is very limiting because there are other ways of thinking and demonstrating one's thinking that has nothing to do with language at all. Exactly, but the way I, my, I am a discourse analyst, so that's where other people look at different kinds of things. I'm interested in this relationship between language and discourse is fundamental mm -hmm. for all human beings and all communication. So understanding discourse very well is a good way to understand society and vice versa understand society mm -hmm. i always say to people if you want to understand racist discourse you first have to understand racism and then you can look at this and then you can look at this exactly. but people who know about racism they can learn a lot about racism if they also have a look at racist discourse so it goes together and it always is always related to our mind and so what we know less about is what goes on here Mm -hmm. And let, let's say the universe of our ignorance 
is what I, I can see in our brain. Yes, yes. But that I, I'm not neuropsychologist and people are advancing that, but we still know very, very little about that. Okay, well, thank you very much for all of these insights and um, it's just a personal history. Yes, yes, but it's it's fascinating and it helps us to have a general view of the field and 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 your contributions, which are Thank totally you. amazing. Thank you for asking me and open open up this <laughs> this Pandora box of <laughs> of, of, the, of the I know things. It was fascinating to be able and understand because I have a very bad memory. But I noticed that when you ask about these things, suddenly names I would not be able to produce, uh, of people I've met 50, 60 years ago, they, my goodness, it helps also to keep my mind, you know, and, and I know a little bit about memory, but, uh -huh. and about episodic memory and, and personal memory. It also makes me think and rethink, why is it so? Why, why was I all, why is it that only at the end of the 1970s I became interested in social stuff? Although I'm from a poor family. Uh -huh. I mean, I should know about poverty. I should know about uh, of forms of oppression and so on and so on. Another thing I've not been mentioning, but I would like to add as well, is the extreme importance of in my work, in my personal life, and also is the work and of women. Uh -huh. I mean, I would not be practically all my peace and women because that's our field uh -huh. uh, but to know bright PhD students are women I learned from them and they learned from me and I see always when new things are being done uh -huh. it's mostly women who do it and the forms of resistance also against slavery very often were women uh -huh. uh, the anti-racist stuff are women what we learn about anti-racism comes from feminism. So I've been one of my first wife in, in the 70s, uh, who was already a feminist and reading feminist literature and so on is very fundamental in my personal development, learning from women, admiring women. Uh, most of the work I do and most of the work I do also as a discourse, now as an as a editor of journals, is uh, the advice and the reviews of the contribution of women. Uh, you know, people like Ruth Waldeck and many others, mm -hmm. uh, with, of whom I've learned a lot. So for me, it, I mean, I feel very much as being not only a feminist, but even a radical feminist. Okay. <laughs> radical in the sense that, that what things I most are furious about is machismo and abuse of against women. I mean, there's nothing that makes me more furious in my private life as this particular, if I read articles about m mistreatment or discrimination or worse against women, that for me is the worst of all. So mm -hmm. that's my personal political, personal view of things and my admiration of women who, despite all these kinds of things, became full professors in universities, um, got children, families, and so on and so on. That for me is, uh, is extremely, extremely important in my life. I didn't mention it, but through all this, not only my personal mm -hmm. life, but all uh, through all this is also um, this very important role of women also in my personal life. Mm -hmm. You know, I have also professors, doctors, and so on, but uh -huh. it's crucial for me to have this kind of it's a daily inspiration in my work, in my political decision making, in my view of the world. If I could say it is very much not only anti-racist but also feminist. Mm -hmm. But I did not do feminist work because the women do it much better than I could do. So I, I was <laughs> doing just anti-racist and anti-racist stuff. But it has been inspired constantly by the fantastic role of women in in, in life and in the world. Uh -huh. So that's for me also very important and it's nice to stop with that. Okay, very good, very good. So thank you very much too. It's been wonderful talking to you, it really has. Thank you so much. Thank you for talking, let me talk. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Kinda, okay? Perfect. Are you happy? Thank you so much. Yes. How much was it? 